What's going on fam? Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me for another fantastic interview. Now today, I know there are a lot of questions about having an NCAA coach on the channel and finally made that happen. He's a friend of mine from Seattle. We played together several summers ago in college and he now coaches at a Division II college down in Florida. Pablo Gallo, it has been awesome having him on, and hopefully he answers all the questions that you guys have uh, have had over the last several months about how to get recruited to college soccer, how to go through that process, and of course, how to contact those college coaches. So without further ado, let's hop into the video. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for being on. I really appreciate it. And uh, why don't we do a little bit of intro first, um, your name, where you played, where you're from, and uh, what you're doing now. So my name is Pablo Gallo Arias. I am uh, one of the assistant coaches over at Florida Southern College. Um, I have grew up in the Northwest. Um, was born in Columbia, lived there for a couple of years, but then I grew up in the Northwest for the most part, um, bounced around between Seattle and Portland. We met in, in Seattle, in the Redmond area, uh, when we played over at Crossfire. Um, after Crossfire, I went and played soccer at Florida Southern College, which is where I'm now coaching. Um, spent my four years there, um, played all four years, and then um, ended up joining in with the coaching staff pretty much right after. I graduated December of 2018. Um, which was a semester early, but then went back home for a couple of months and decided I kind of wanted to give this whole coaching thing a go. And um, luckily at the time, the, the head coach at the time was more than happy to, to get me involved. And that's kind of where everything started. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you coach before doing the college stuff or did you kind of just hop straight into college coaching? So, I mean, to what you could call coaching in terms of like having my own team. Not really. Uh, I had a, now I have a, a youth team that I, that I coach. Um, I coach a U15 girls team in the Lakeland area, which is central Florida. I'm right between Tampa and uh, Tampa and Orlando. Um, okay. But apart from that, like team coaching, you know, the, the summer camps, I hammered the summer camps all summers when from like age 16 on. Um, and I'm sure you've probably heard about it, but Toka training, um mm -hmm. it's uh the ball delivery system so i was very lucky to get in with toka right as they were beginning in the northwest so Damn. this is like first studio in the northwest it was a, a very small room we didn't have like now you look at it they have like the goals that light up tell you where to go like back then it was the machine um mm. myself with the ipad and then you had like four pug goals basically set up um so i Again, super lucky to be a part of that. Um, I want to say that was like my sophomore year of college. And then I would go back every summer and, and continue to coach there. So I did about three years with Token. You know, it's been awesome to see that company grow. Fantastic. Yeah. How was, let's go for, I want to start first with sort of your collegiate recruiting process and then get into sort of your now from the coaching perspective, but let's go, let's go first from a player's perspective. So played at Crossfire, when did you start getting recruited? How was that process for you? And then sort of end like why you chose to go to Florida. So I would say everything, like my parents wanted to start as soon as I became a junior and you know how that is. It's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm all right. Um, I would say I really started digging into it when I was getting, approaching my, my, uh, my senior year. Um, mm -hmm that's when I would say I, I definitely started getting a lot more serious because you, you, you kind of realize, you know, okay, I, I can't drag my feet on it. Um, to be honest, it was a slow, it was a very, very slow recruitment period. I, uh, I did, I did the camps and whatnot. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll d dive into it a little bit later, but I, I kind of had that mentality of like D1 or bust. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a great reality check. There was a couple of schools up in the Northwest that I was very excited about and that's where I wanted to go. And, um, you know, initially you're, you're going to the camps, you're, you're having them come out to the showcases and they're showing some interest, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a very tough, tough industry. And, um, I remember it was the day before I took my first SAT. Um, I was driving to my SAT location, pulled up my phone real quick to pull up like the, like the information for where I had to go and all whatnot. And then I had a coach or I had an email from, like my top school that I really, really wanted to get into. And there was like, Hey, unfortunately at this time, 
we just don't see you being a part of our plan. I remember just sitting in the car like, oh, like this is tough. Like how am I supposed to sit through yeah. a three hour test right now? Um, but that was a great reality check. You know, it made you realize at that point, it's just time to buckle down and grind. And I'm sure within the next week, I probably sent about like 300 emails just trying to get anything. Just um, the little video that I had just out to as many coaches as I could. Um, ended up going to a camp in Florida, big camp. It was over at USF campus in, in Tampa. And uh, there was a lot of schools there. Um, and it was funny. So where I ended up, Florida Southern, um, initially wasn't in my radar at all, but I had two buddies that played a crossfire that were older than both of us. I don't know if you remember him, Michael Cor, right? And then Samuel mm -hmm. Turner, Michael from Anacortes. Um, he was a good friend of mine when we were on the team and he had gone there. He had transferred there from, uh, from Skagit County or Sk yeah, community college. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ran into the coach of the time. Um, and I was like, Oh, like, how's Mike doing? Blah, blah, blah. Like just honestly was not looking for anything. Wasn't like trying to like position myself in front of this coach or anything. Just wanted to hear about Mike. And sure enough, about a week after the camp, I'm heading down to surf cup and, I've got an email from the coach saying, hey, like, we'd love to have you come out for a visit. Um, ended up going out for a visit in October of that year. And then, um, yeah, I committed later on, like, right at the beginning of, of 2018, it would have been. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So so very, very unconventional as far as, like, most most people in their mind, I feel like, think that it's a very – you know, people come to you. It's such oh, a yeah. – no, like not at all. <laughs> not like that. Not yeah. at all. Okay. And what, what division is Florida Southern in? So Florida Southern, we're uh, division two. We play in the Sunshine State Conference, which, um, you know, if you do any sort of research into division two, you quickly find out that um, it's like the most elite conference that there is. Um, I, take a, I take a lot of pride saying that just because it's crazy to me that every single year, it seems like we got four or five different teams jumping into that top 25 at any given point. Um, yeah. you know, I grew up in the Northwest and I know that the Northwest is its own caliber, but just moving here, it, it's just such a contrast between the conferences. Um, mm -hmm. our conference, you look at the, you look at the average age in a, in a starting roster, you're probably shooting about 22, even 25. Um, Damn. it's a very, very, very mature league. Um, so and it, it's grown into that even more, like from my freshman year um, to, which was what, 2015? Yeah, mm -hmm. 2015, even to now, the league has just continued and continued to get even older and stronger. Um, but you're seeing it across the entire, across the entire country and across D2 as well. I think um, a lot of teams are kind of starting to, to, push on and become older and older and older just because it, it seems to be winning and you know everyone wants to win so for sure is there different rules for division two as far as age goes than d1 or yeah, d3 so, so it's slightly different than d1 in d1 um basically you have a eligibility clock and mm -hmm. basically you get one year off which is a gap year um and then as soon as that year is off as soon as that year off is done, your clock starts, right? So regardless of whether you go to a school or not, um, let's say I graduated in 2015, well, 2014, technically, if I had have basically sat out my whole season of 2015, and then even set out 2016, and then went to a school, I would only have mm -hmm. three years left instead of four. Now, in D2, that rule is slightly different. That rule only applies if you go to a school that has soccer as an as a sport as a athletic sport or a varsity sport but mm -hmm. don't join in so let's say that i went to um i don't know some school right and they have soccer right my clock would start now if that school doesn't have soccer my clock does not start and that's the way it works for d2 so um that's that's the reason why you see some guys that are like older 20s um we have I've seen a couple of players that are in their thirties playing in, in, in division two. Um, so yeah, it's a, it, it's a crazy game. It's a crazy game, the D2. Yeah, for sure. That's wild. I had it like coming from a D3 perspective. It's like very, like very small, very, uh, 
and, and even then the caliber difference between certain conferences is wild as well. I'm sure you find that at the D2 level, but it's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. Let's talk about a little bit about sort of the, as a, from a, from a player's perspective, your mindset going from D1 or bust to I'm going to, it's not about settling necessarily, but I'm going to go for a D2 mm -hmm. school and I feel okay with that. No, for sure. I mean, um, so I, when I, when I made the decision to go to Florida, I was looking between here and a school up in Connecticut and big, big deciding factor between the two was what do I foresee myself seeing and or doing in like, let's say December or November when the season is over, do I want to be, mm. you know, shoveling snow to be able to go train or do I want to be able to, you know, walk out in a pair of shorts and in a tank top and realize, okay, life's good right now. And um, ultimately that was kind of the pushing factor. Obviously I was aware of, um, of the level of, of play. Uh, when I mm -hmm. came down from my visit, I watched um, Florida Southern play against at the time, the number eight team in the nation. Um, so, and it was a competition the entire time. So I knew that I was going to a team that could compete. I was going to a conference that could compete. And, you know, I think you ask anybody, players want to play against the best, you know? Right. It's, it, it's not really that fun to steamroll a team like 7-0. So um, yep. you want to go to compete. So at the end of the day, decided to go to Florida Southern. Um, and uh, I'll say about Crossfire, one of the things that I loved is that they always just prepared you to be a grinder. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a, the whole club mentality that they have up there. And that's what I was prepared to do when I got here. I was very, very fortunate. I was one of two true freshmen to start my freshman year. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think I got like the starting job, like four games into the season, um, and basically kept it on for the rest of the year. Um, but I mean, it was me and an English guy that had come from a top, uh, English Academy and, Right. You know, I felt I felt very proud of that. Um, you know, like I said, got here, grinded. Um, huge thing for me was always like control the things that you can control. So fitness tests, all that stuff, showing up early to training. I can control all that stuff. So I made sure I did. Um, you know, I was always within like the top three of every single fitness test, mm -hmm. uh, even as a scrawny 18 year old kid. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that I, I, I knew I was always going to be fine if I could control those things. Um, yep. obviously there's times where your touch may not be, to, be on or, um, you know, things just aren't kind of falling your way, but there's things that you can control. And as long as you're controlling them day in and day out, you're going to get opportunities. Um, so that's what I did and, you know, grew into my, into my role. Um, yeah, so it was a, it was an awesome experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think that's a, that's a key point you made too. Like, making sure you control the controllables has been a, a big piece of, I mean, you think about, I, did you guys, do you, at the D2 level, do you guys have a spring season of any sort? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So we played, we played a couple of D, uh, D1 teams down in the, in the Florida area. Um, yep. You know, we played Gulf coast, um, which has always been an excellent top team. Uh, we played Stetson, which is a, um, a school just outside of Orlando. They are in the same conferences. Um, as uh, Gulf Coast, and then the only other eh, those no, we played Florida Atlantic as well. Okay, um, those are the only three that we played when I was around, um, and then like now we we've added a couple to the to like the spring season um, schedule and into like the preseason schedule even before the season. Definitely, yeah, I think that's again like the the that's one thing you get with d d1 and d2 that's that's definitely in my opinion better than d3 is like in d3 you basically had an allotment of 15 or 20 sessions that the coach could run but outside of that we had no friendlies no no spring season or whatever and so and so for me you know controlling the controllables right so working on my own fitness working on my own technical stuff that stuff becomes really important. And I'm sure now as a coach, you see that on the opposite end, right? Like you notice the guys who are putting in those, oh, for th sure. those works. No, for sure. It's, it, it's even different for us than it is for D1. We're not, you know, I, I'm not going to speak on it because I'm not exactly sure how much they have, or even if they have any sort of limit, but we have uh, 45 playing dates basically. Um, okay. That that's that's our spring season. So within those forty five days, we we have to we have to adhere to certain um, countable hour rules. Um, mm -hmm. It's called Kara, 
which is uh, countable athletic related activities. Um, so basically anything as like film um, that goes into that um, practices, all that stuff. We have a certain amount of things that, or we have a certain amount of hours that we have to adhere to per week. Um, we can't go over that. Um, so it, it's definitely different. Um, and it, it can be restrictive, but like you said, you see the guys that are putting in the work um, on their own to, to get better and not have to re like rely solely on the small amount of time that we are allowed to be with our players. Definitely. Then from a coaching perspective, what are, I want to get into some really good, valuable, like action items for players thinking about going to college for soccer. So what are some things from a coaching perspective, like blanket, like what do you look for in players when you are recruiting? Is it position specific? Is it mental? Is it physical, tactical, all the above? Like, what do you guys look for in players when you say go to a surf cup tournament or something? So it, it does vary by position for sure. Um, you know, there's always going to be the intangibles like athleticism. That's always going to be an intangible um, and it'll always stick out. Um, but a huge thing, especially for me, is just like greediness, like mm. not necessarily not necessarily like being a dirty player or anything like that, but just a, a constant will to, you know, get stuck into challenges or you know, if you get knocked down going into a tackle, like how quickly do you get up and, and then track back? Um, mm -hmm. Stuff like that for me is huge. Um, just because that's, that's stuff that you can work with. You know, it's always about having a good attitude. I want, and not just myself, but our entire coaching staff, we look for guys that we know that we can work with. And we know that when we look at them and say like, listen, maybe you're not there right there, but continue to work. Um, and you're going to get your opportunities instead of being like, ah, coaches having it out for me I'm not going to get to play mm -hmm. they're like okay like I'm going to get after it right and I'm, I'm going to follow the things that I need to do uh, I'm going to keep on working hard to become the player that I know I can be um so I mean at, at tournaments again greediness huge um respectful you'd be amazed at how many times I'll be sitting down and watching a game and like an entire team of kids like just parks their view right in front of me and I'm like What's going on, boys? Um, that's a huge one. It, it, that, I guess that's a pet peeve of mine, but I think little stuff like that matters. Um, how you behave yourself towards referees, um, mm. how you behave yourself towards your teammates. You know, are you the type of person that when things go wrong, are you shouting at everybody else? Or are you, again, just putting your head down and working a little bit harder? Um, from there, I think... The way, the way that I, a lot of the times we process things is we'll, we'll see guys like that. We see guys that fit into that certain portfolio that we like, and maybe not necessarily because of how they play in that game, just because we know that they have the intangibles. Then when we see them again and we see them playing a different environment, whether that be one of our camps um, or perhaps even if they were able to jump into a training session, which is one of the rules that we're allowed to have, you know, potential recruits, they get allowed one training session. Um, wow. If they jump in, and they, we see that they can make our team better. And I kind of like, why would that be a, a bad idea for us to bring them in? For right? sure. No. no, that's fantastic. So then from watching a player, how does that recruitment process go from start to finish? And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of chime in if there's any like specific details that you can cover, but like from, you know, you see a player, he's got those intangibles. So then it's an invitation to some sort of event where you can see him play again, or how does that work? So it, it really depends. I mean, there's obviously there's guys that are overseas. We recruit heavily overseas as well. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, both my, the other assistant and my, and uh, the head coach are both from England. So when they go back home for the holidays, they're able to, you know, go around a little bit and be able to watch some players um, in terms of domestic players, obviously, Exposure events, camps, huge. Um, showcases, huge. I'm going to be, you know, we hammer all of the tournaments that are down here in Florida, uh, whether that be the Disney Showcase, the MLS is next, the USL Y League, um, all these different events. From there, um, we identify the players that we like, um, mm -hmm. and that's when a camp invitation goes out. We really focus on um, – we really, really try to bring our domestic players into a camp first. If you look at our roster, 
I want to say over 80% of the players that are domestic in our previous year's roster went through the camp process um, because that's a pool of players that we've identified and we work really hard on identifying players that we really genuinely think can make a difference in our program. Um, Mm -hmm. Bring them in, they'll play, show out, depending on from there, whether it be, it's a little bit easier, obviously, if it's a guy from Florida to be able to invite them back and be like, Hey, like jump into a session, see how you do. Um, if it's somebody from out of state, then we obviously we have to make those decisions for for, you know, for the program. And um, yeah, from there, it's it, it's usually like a two, like three ish step process, you know, identification, mm-hmm. putting them together with that almost player pool and then um, potentially an offer from there on. Fantastic. And then if let's say person a needs absolutely zero financial help they've got it all sorted out they're ready to go and person b needs close to a full ride how do both of those go let's say everything else equal so grades equal playing equal all that stuff how do you go about those two situations obviously it's difficult so our the way our program works we're not fully funded as a program um, okay. And because of that, it can be difficult. Now, the, the great thing about D2 is that we can stack um, athletic as well as academic. Mm. Right? So obviously, when we recruit, we we value very, very highly um, a player's GPA, a player's SAT scores, because all of that stuff at the end of the day is going to help that player um, lessen the overall burden financially on themselves and their family. Um, For sure. So in a situation like that, you know, it it's difficult just because again, it's a, it's a four-year commitment. A lot of the times players are like, okay, I can commit to this, but does that, let's say things aren't going well, you're not playing, you're not getting your minutes. Does it still make sense for that family to make that financial commitment Mm -hmm. if they are, you know, kind of pushing the boundaries of their limits? Now, if it's a family that can afford it, obviously, then it's it's a different conversation there. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what's your G? Like just out of curiosity, what's your sort of GPA cap of like where you kind of look above? So we really look to shoot for anything above a three point oh, um, and then an eleven hundred nice. SAT. Um, again, like I just mentioned, grades are huge just because it's going to make your life a lot easier. I went into Florida Southern with a um, 382 or something like that. And then my SAT, unfortunately, wasn't that great. I think I had like a 1200 um, or maybe just below that. I can't remember. Um, but it helped me, right? It helped me enough that I could get into that place. Um, you know, I came in with no scholarship whatsoever. And then after my freshman year, I started to earn some. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's always important for players to know that it's not a done deal. If you come in with no money, it's always not a done deal. If you come in with money, right. Mm. You can either earn, you can earn money and you can lose money just as quickly. Um, it's a yearly commitment. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a great opportunity for grinders. Like, a, you know, if you, if you're willing to put in the work and you are willing to bet on yourself, then there's always more opportunities that it can be, um, that can come your way. Yeah. And I imagine too, the, the kids with the higher grades, and more academic prowess perhaps when they're in season and they do have to balance that school and soccer life like they're much more well off than the guys who struggle in school right because i mean you know what it's like like you stay up late writing a paper and then you have to go like here in florida during the season as much as everybody loves florida because of how beautiful and obviously the warm it is like in this in in the season time from three o'clock to seven o'clock, you have no idea what's going to happen with the weather. Like all of a sudden you could get a lightning strike. And the way it works is if that lightning strike is within a certain amount of miles, like you are shut down for 30 minutes until there's no more lightning strikes in that area. So Mm. if you set, if you schedule a session at three o'clock and at three Oh three, you have a lightning strike within that radar or within that, you know, area, 30 minutes are gone and you have to just continue to push things back until you're clear. And if it like you get back out on the field and it hits again, then you know, sucks. You're back in delay. So all of our training sessions, like 7 a.m. start, um, <clears throat> because that way you don't have to deal with it. So again, right. you stay up late the night before studying, cramming for a test, whatever it may be, you show up to practice, you're not gonna train well, 
right? You're going to be sleepy. You're not going to be attentive. You're probably going to mess up the drill because you didn't know whether you had to go this way or that way. Um, and all that stuff, just no one, you know, no one likes that. We don't like that as coaches having to be, having to be like, Hey, what's going on? And, you know, no player likes to get into a drill, mess it up for everybody. Um, so if you can take care of yourself academically and push your own weight, you're just making your life so much easier for yourself when you get into college. Definitely. What's, what are the ways that are most beneficial for players to contact a college coach and get their attention? It, I mean, there's no, there's no like magic pill for it. Like just, it, it's about grinding and you know, it's not even just, in high school going to college it's college going to pro it's if you're going in the professional world um it's just there's there's a not necessarily a workaround but there's definitely shortcuts like if you know people that's huge um Mm. but at the end of the day it's just emailing and emailing and emailing and emailing um it's funny uh when i was going through the recruitment process not with this school but funny enough with the with the other school school up in the northeast that I ended up choosing not to go to um originally before I had visited Florida Southern that that was my number one obviously a lot of it had to do with the D1 tag to it um Mm -hmm. but I remember for about a month and a half I called their their office every single morning um because obviously they're three hours ahead from when I was up in Seattle so I would call their office every single morning at like 7 a.m right before I got to school I'm telling you for about a month and a half, no pickup, no pickup, no pickup, no pickup, no pickup. And eventually, you know, eventually you get through to them and eventually you can talk to them and it's just about grinding. So emails, huge. If you are interested in a school and you go to a, whether it be a camp or a tournament or whatever it may be, any kind of place where you're around that coach, introduce yourself and be like, hey, I sent you an email today. Um, Don't be surprised if you hear like, Oh, sorry. I haven't gone to that email because Mm. it's especially at this point of the season when the season's over and you're um, finally able to really dive into those emails. It takes a while to get through your mailbox. Like right now, I think I have, let me check. I have 58 emails unread (laughs) and that's after I went through three hours this morning. Like it's Uh, damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Okay. And maybe, maybe for the guy. So I get a lot of questions about like, Oh, I don't want to, and again, to me, this is an excuse because I know what it's like to, mm-hmm. to do that email grind and, and you do as well. So m- perhaps dispel a little bit of the, well, I'm afraid I'm going to annoy them and they're going to ignore me or whatever. Like what is from a coach's perspective, I, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but, but getting emailed constantly to you, does that show this person has the, the grind or is that just like, oh, this person's just being annoying? No, no, for sure. It, it has the grind. Listen. It, like unless they tell you no it's not a no right silence yeah, is not yeah. a no that's a huge thing that's a huge thing that needs to be just like in this college soccer world um unless a coach specifically tells you no it's not a no and the reason I say that is because if I have players like that like even if they've sent me one email and I genuinely don't think that they're going to be a, 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 a fit for the program mm. it's as simple as hey I appreciate your interest in the team um, unfortunately at this point, we're not looking to like to further your recruitment. It's as simple as that. It, it, it sucks. It happened to me multiple times, but at the end of the day, like the sooner that, you know, then the sooner that, that you can go pursue a different school, right. Mm-hmm. And kind of move your, move your attention elsewhere. Right? Every, every door that closes is an opportunity elsewhere. And that's, that's the way you just have to look at it. So again, it, it's annoying to some extent sure. but at the end of the day it shows me that you're interested in the school and i'd much rather have a guy that like again falls in love with the school and plays soccer than play soccer and doesn't like the school does that make mm-hmm. sense 100 percent. yeah well i mean that's i junior year i was injured the entire year and thank god i loved this and i went because of the school exactly and i didn't find that my life was miserable when I couldn't play exactly exactly and that's a huge thing again that goes hand in hand with what I was saying about um when I made my decision we had mm. a player this year that had a season ending injury at the very beginning like literally first training session of the <laughs> actual season and it was devastating because he was a, a transfer uh we were very very excited to get him in and you know he never he never officially got to wear the the jersey so it was devastating thing but at the end of the day he loved the school I mean how could you not you're in Florida um, yeah 
So he had a good time. It ended up working out for him. He'll be graduating this semester. So um, nice. Fall in love with the school. That's a huge, 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 huge piece of advice. Yeah, that's gold. That's gold. Is there any kind of last, maybe, maybe like one or two things that you would recommend for the young high school athletes to just, what, what are the two biggest things or three biggest things that they can do to help them get to where you were, you know, a couple of years ago playing, starting every game, playing, balling out in college? Um, I mean, it really depends on, on every situation, whether you're going to a program, um, you know, I was lucky enough. I was, I was going to this program at a point of not necessarily transition, but, um, where you could feel that there was like a change coming in. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you could feel that there was like a new, um, like style of leadership going into Mm -hmm. it, style of, you know, not, not being okay with historical performances. Historically, Florida Southern um, had been very bad for a long time. Um, you know, still to this day, not a NCAA appearance. That's a completely different story though, because it's extremely difficult in our conference. Um, mm-hmm. But since, since arriving there, you can see that it's progressively gotten better. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, things have continued to go up. And so, to that, in that regards, it kind of matters to know what you're stepping into. Um, I stepped into a place with a whole bunch of opportunity and I just kind of embraced it. Um, that's not to say though, like if you're stepping into a place like a well-established program, whether that be D1, D2, don't be discouraged by there not being a spot on the field for you immediately. Mm-hmm. Right? And understand that it takes time. Right. A lot of the guys that are starting have been playing for this coach for two, three years. Right. So the not only built up relationships off the field, the coach trusts them on the field. You have to earn that trust. Um, and a lot of the times it takes more than, uh, you know, the three weeks, whatever you get of preseason. Um, mm-hmm. So understand that it's a process. Understand that you have to get in every single day, put in the work. Be OK with potentially having to learn and adapt to the league. But at the same time, don't be okay with this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my career. Mm. Because it's not unless you let it be. Right? Right. It's not unless you let it be. And we have guys that, you know, stepped in last year. Obviously, last year was a bit funky with the whole COVID year. We got a, a full fall just to train, a full fall and spring just to train. Um, and then this year came around and minutes were there on the table for them. So it's mm. not, again, it's not a situation whether – Oh, I'm a freshman. I'm not going to come in and play. No, it's a, it's an opportunity for, for you to really decide if you want it and step in and work and work and work and put your name on the, on the team sheet every single week. Yeah, that's fantastic. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Of course, bro. The answers were awesome. I think, I think those are, those are going to be huge for, for young players who are looking to get into college. Cause I think that's uh, the, the, you are sort of in the driver's seat of your own situation, even if Mm -hmm. you get told, right? Like, Hey, you're not going to play right away because we got a senior who's in your spot. But like, that doesn't mean you can't grind your ass off, you know, like Mm -hmm. that stuff's huge for players to understand. And at the end of the day, like it's, it's important to know that it's not, it's not an age thing, right? Like Mm -hmm. we've had, we've had, again, this year, we had players come in as 18 year olds playing against 23 year old men that, have played in the the youth leagues in Germany, mm-hmm. youth leagues in England, youth leagues all over the world, and come in and start and be excellent for us. And at the end of the day, the way we look at it is that we're going to put the best players on the field. Mm-hmm. Right? We're going to put the best players on the field. We're going to put the players that we can trust. So as long as you can come in, gain our trust, and know that when we put you in an assignment, you're going to take care of that assignment, whether it be as simple as – following your mark on a set piece that's us earning your trust right you take care of the little details and they'll pile up and pile up and pile up and then the opportunities open for sure for sure awesome man well thank you very much i appreciate it and uh yeah best of luck for the spring season and hope it all goes well thank you man thank you yeah awesome have a good one
you as well. Bye-bye. Take care, boss. All right, fam, that's it for the video. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Pablo. Obviously, if you have any questions or you want to attend a school like Pablo's, feel free to reach out to me and I can give you extra advice. You can also go to my website and I've got an entire pamphlet on sale that goes walks you through the entire process of getting recruited in the NCAA schools and it should be pretty applicable to the, uh, the junior college system as well. So that is it for the video. Thanks so much for joining me, guys. As always, be awesome. Take care. I'll see you guys in the next one.